it, I think, for housekeeping. Um, so just to say welcome uh, to the second talk of the symposium, um, Reproduction, Parenthood and the Art World. Um, joined today with Frank Abusasis, hope I've said correctly, uh, and Alma Hazia. Um, they're gonna they're gonna give a talk, and uh, there's two different talks today. Uh, so Frank is gonna be talking first, and he's gonna be talking about Cow House Studios, uh, which he runs with his his wife Rosie Bowman. Um, is an artist led school, uh, but it also has residencies, and he is going to specifically talk to us today about the parent artist residency. So I'll hand over to you. Great, thanks, Andrea. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Great. So um, I thought it would make most sense to talk a little bit about the studios and how they started and really the ethos behind um, the space before I get into talking specifically about the parenting program. Uh, I'm going to share my screen here. So hopefully everybody can see that now. Uh, this is just a photograph of the outside of the studio on the right hand side. Uh, it was a cow house, uh, as they call it here, um, until we renovated the building um, in 2007, 2006 and 2007 is really when all the renovations happened uh, at the studio. And Cow House is located uh, on my wife's family farm. So, you know, uh, as Andrea mentioned, uh, Rosie O'Gorman, my wife, uh, we co-direct the studios. We, we established the studios. Uh, our first year fully up and running was 2008. And um, leading up to that, you know, there was a lot of planning involved in, in addition to, to the renovations. Um, and there were a lot of key people involved in that. Um, most notably, my, my brother-in-law, Drew Casey, um, who really guided us on the financial side of things. He has a, a great business mind, but he's also a really good teacher. Rosie and I, we met in grad school in San Francisco and we studied art. We both received our MFA, so business training was, was not part of that at all. So his help was really invaluable. Um, and then also uh, Rosie's father, uh, Michael O'Gorman, um, first of all, the generosity in gifting us two buildings, uh, the cow house itself and the, the barn, which is adjacent, which we uh, renovated into accommodation. Uh, in addition to that incredible generosity, uh, he also led the, the renovation project. Um, here you can see what the cow house looked like uh, before we got our hands on it. Uh, beautiful building, beautiful structure, but obviously not ready for artists. Um, here you can see it. Uh, there's Rosie and her father in the, in the building. Um, and, you know, it was, it was used for bedding cows in the winter. Um, it was built in uh, 1908. And uh, it's, it's a very wide building compared to a lot of other barn structures in Ireland. Um, and you know, it was built with the mind of having a loft space, but it was never put in. Um, but, you know, the farm through, throughout its history was a, a multi-purpose farm. They had hens, they had dairy cattle, they had beef cattle, uh, they grew some crops, uh, they had sheep um, and all sorts of things. Uh, but by the time uh, Michael, uh, by the time I met Michael, he was primarily um, raising beef cattle. Um, so so the, the shed here was, was used for, for that purpose in the winter time. Um, I should mention that this place, uh, this farm has been in Rosie's family for, for almost 300 years. And so there's a real sense of, of history on the farm and it really informs uh, people's stay with us. Um, I have a few shots here of, of renovation. Uh, it was really hands-on. We learned a lot, um, you know, in a lot of ways, it was good that we were a little bit ignorant of the path ahead because I don't know if we really would have taken it all on uh, if we knew it was in store. And you can see here, Michael installing one of the eight roof lights uh, in the studio building. Um, and then here's like a lot of late nights, um, but it was this really exciting time. 
um, it felt like we were at the start of, of something really big. Um, and, you know, I think one of the things about Cowhouse from its conception, Rosie and I always wanted it to be a way um, for us to support ourselves, um, to allow us to raise a family, but also provide, you know, a way to be engaged in, in art and art making in, in a lot of different forms, um, you know, for the foreseeable future. And, and that's why there was so much planning involved. And, and it was really important that we, we developed a sustainable model so that we knew, um, you know, we could rely on it uh, into the future. Um, and, and, and that's thankfully what it has, has become. Um, here you can see the studio pretty much as it exists today. Uh, we have four individual studio spaces for, for artists. We have a kind of a large uh, working space in the middle where we teach classes, but artists also utilize that space during the residency time. We have computers for digital work. We have a dark room. Um, we have a, a print room for, for digital work uh, with a large 44 inch Epson printer. Uh, we have some sculpture facilities and, and woodworking tools. Um, and, and yeah, so there's, there's a lot of different things that, that people can do at the studios. Um, and the way we're set up is, is a little bit unique. So Rosie and I both have a real interest in teaching. Uh, it's, it's something that we've always done. Rosie actually has a degree in art education um, from NCAD. Uh, the National College of Art and Design up in Dublin. And when we met out in San Francisco, um, you know, that's where the ideas for Cowhouse really started. And we, we knew that there was public funding available, but I suppose we wanted to develop a model that was a little bit more independent, that didn't rely year to year on, on Arts Council funding something that, that we could um, build on year after year. And so we decided that in order to support the residencies, we would have an educational program. Um, and this educational program started with our summer program. So the summer program runs for 25 days and we teach young kids, you know, 16 to 18 years old. Um, we teach them drawing, painting, photography, video, animation and things like that. Um, they come in kind of choosing a, a concentration and they stay with us and we travel the country a bit. And it's a really wonderful experience. You know, I, I think when, when we started teaching, uh, I don't know if I realized how much I was gonna learn uh, by, by teaching uh, and especially teaching younger, younger kids. Um, but, but it really gave me a lot of clarity on my own practice and, and Rosie feels the same. And, uh, it's been a great way for us to uh, stay engaged with younger generations. And it's kind of amazing because we started in 2008, we were 29 years old, and uh, a lot of our students are now getting their MFAs. So it really feels like we're entering like a new phase of, of our own life. Um, but it's great to see that. It's great to see some of our former students, you know, pursuing that. Um, so anyway, the, the fees uh, for the summer program from the very beginning were, were really important because they're what made all of our residencies possible because we really didn't want to be charging uh, big fees for, for, for residencies. We, we were very aware of the lack of um, finances for, for artists and um, it wasn't really ever about for us. A, a way to make a living. We just love being around artists who are making work and, and we love uh, seeing that process happen. And so um, that was very much something that we just felt like it was important for our own kind of, um, our own interests as, as visual artists and our own desire to support art practice. Um, we really thrive off of community. And, and so that was really where the motivations came from for, for the residency programs. 
and the teaching has has become just a way for us to to make that happen year after year um, with with regularity we have since added a gap year program so this is for 18 to 22 year old students um, this one is it's a longer program it's it's three months so it's 12 weeks long and it happens in the fall and again it's it's really important in terms of allowing us to operate independently throughout the year um, but also uh, it, it's it's a great way for us to learn and work with artists who are just that bit older, um, work with them for a longer period of time. It's, it's one of my favorite programs that we run um, that they, they grow so much uh, during, during that time. And, you know, we, we develop really nice relationships with them. And, you know, I feel like a lot of our students, they, they've, what we've seen is that they've stayed in touch um, and they, and they want to stay connected with, with the studio and keep Rosie and I filled in on on what they're doing. And we even have some of our gap year students coming back this summer to help out during the summer program. Um, here you can see Rosie looking at some large paintings from one of our students uh, during our 2019 uh, autumn gap year program. And so this takes me to the residencies. So in our first year, we went, we ran one residency. Um, it was a 12 week residency. Um, and it's funny because if you look at the residencies, they really mirror where Rosie and I were in our own art practice at any given time. And so, you know, we wanted to give artists a long period of time to make work and not feel pressure um, to, to work towards any exhibition. We, we thought there was real value in being uh, on the farm because it really is an amazing place to focus. Um, there, there aren't a lot of distractions. Um, and it's a place where, you know, people can kind of forget about everything else um, and work through whatever it is that they're working through in, in the studio, but also have a small community of, of like-minded people there to, to bounce ideas off of. And, you know, Rosie and I will often make studio visits with, with artists and, and they'll often organize their own talks and presentations. Um, and it's, it's a really nice moment. And through the years we've experimented with different models. Uh, I think this is a photo from a residency we ran called How to Flatten a Mountain, which was a photography based residency in partnership with Photo Ireland. Um, but we've done all sorts of collaborations with different institutions. Um, and we also in 2015 started running a curated residency um, our first year, we ran a residency with Kate Strain and Rachel Gilborn. Um, and, you know, this was a really interesting opportunity because up until this point, Rosie and I had been selecting the residency artists ourselves. And, um, you know, it was very much an extension of, of, of our own vision for the space. But when we started inviting curators, we realized that there was so much more potential in ways of thinking about where we were in our particular location um, and different sorts of issues uh, that, that can arise. And, um, you know, that that's really enriched the space. Um, it also made Cow House a little bit more visible um, to the broader community, especially within Ireland. Um, and so it was a really important turning point for us. Uh, and it's also when we started receiving regular funding from Wexford County Council, which allowed us to put a little bit more funding into the program. Um, let's go to the next slide. So for our partnership in 2017, our curatorial partnership, we approached Mothership. Um, and what I'm gonna do here um, is, is read a little excerpt from a publication they made as part of this satellite project, because I think they sum up um, their, their organization very well here. Uh, so in April 2013, an email was circulated between a few female artists with children to discuss their experience of parenthood and being an artist. There was an immediate response with the original email being shared with over 20 female artists and arts workers who exchanged views, ideas, and links in relation to the subject of being an artist and a parent. From this, the Mothership Project was born. 
Over the next year, the mothership held meetings to deal with core issues for parenting artists, time, money, and precarity, the perception of artists with children, studio provision, crash facilities, and working from home, and child-friendly residencies. We have also hosted show and tell events and reading groups around the theoretical underpinnings of this equality and solidarity-based project. The Mothership has developed into a network of parenting artists in Ireland with the aim to support parenting artists in the development of their practice and to encourage, encourage arts organizations to make the art world more inclusive place for artists with children. There has been a growing reawakening to the inequalities that face women in society and particularly the impact of having children on women's ability to, the impact of having children on, on women's ability to continue work and develop a successful career. This impact is often equally felt by artist fathers who are actively engaged in childcare. The mothership has developed alongside this and continues to challenge the prevailing systems through which artists make and present art in Ireland today. In 2017, the Mothership Project were awarded a project award from the Arts Council of Ireland to develop a survey to find out what it's like to be a parenting artist in Ireland, pilot a residency specifically catering for parenting artists and their families, and produce a publication on our findings. With further support from Wexford County Council Arts Office, Wexford Arts Center, Visual Carlo and the Irish Museum of Modern Art Residency Program, we have been able to make this publication a reality. This publication survey and resulting recommendations are a snapshot of what it is to be a parenting artist in Ireland in 2019. We wanna change the status quo. The success of this publication will be measured by how quickly it becomes obsolete as the obstacles are removed to artists having a fulfilling and rewarding career while parenting. Um, so the Mothership Project is currently managed by, collectively by four artists, Leah Hilliard, Michelle Brown, Shady O'Sullivan, and Tara Kennedy. Um, so the publication they're referring to is this one right here. I can provide a link to the PDF download um, in, the, in the chat afterwards. Uh, it's worth a read. There's a lot of statistics in there. They did a pretty extensive survey. So it's, it's quite useful as a document. Um, and, you know, Rosie has been involved with Mothership uh, for a while, not since the beginning, but um, she was going to a meeting in 2016 and just kind of put it out there to the group that um, Cowhouse, that we would be open to uh, a collaboration. And, and we didn't really uh, have any specific ideas at the time. We just wanted to let them know that, um, you know, we were keen to collaborate and run a residency in partnership. And, and we didn't really know what form it would take, but we knew that they would do something really amazing with it. And, and they certainly did. Um, so, so they really took the lead in terms of organizing the program. Um, and it was their idea to, in addition to the residency, to do a, a large scale survey and a publication that coincided uh, with the residency itself. And so um, in 2017, I'll just read a, another small bit from, from, the, from the publication. So in 2017, the mothership received the Arts Council pilot residency for parenting artists. So they approached us um, with this specific idea. So through the shared knowledge of, of previous mothership roundtable discussions and events, and from our own experiences as parenting artists, we knew that artists find participating in residencies difficult due to rigid timeframes or the lack of support structures as part of the residency. We wanted to create a residency that would cater to parenting artists' needs. The satellite residency offered on-site childcare, accommodation, and a variety of time slots for artists who wanted to take time to focus on their practice, whether that be two days or two weeks. We wanted to tailor the residency to the needs of the artist and their family. Residencies were offered to artists under three specific streams. Lapse practice, so seeking to find ways back in, newly parenting, practicing and transition, active practice with the need for time. So there was a great uh, interest in the residency. We've received a ton of applications uh, and it was difficult to narrow down the recipients. 
working with a selection panel, including Catherine Marshall, uh, Rosie, uh, my wife, Rosie O'Gorman, Sheena Barrett and Donna McGuire, 15 artists and their families were given time and space to facilitate creative practice within the supportive ethos of Kaha Studios. Rosie and, and myself um, were the hosts um, and we also have children. And, and so we kind of knew a lot about what the challenges might be in terms of organizing the residency it's, itself. So the original, uh, the, the artists who participated in this residency were uh, Dorota Brauna, Neve Davis, Neve Doherty, Stephen Dunn, James Oheka, Sarah Lincoln, Ruth Lyons, Kira McMahon, Susan Montgomery, Cecilia Madun, Sally O'Dowd, Linda Quinlan, Una Quigley, Kate Warner, and Ruby Wallace. Um, so it was, it was a pretty incredible residency to, to take part in. Um, Rosie and I, um, we got so much from, from the program ourselves. And, and one of the things that they did um, after the residency was they, we, they interviewed all the artists just to kind of get some feedback. And I just wanted to show you a few of the, the things that were said. Um, so, so artists completed an exit survey to share their experiences of the residency. The aspects they found beneficial included time and space, which enabled them to concentrate on their work. Childcare and catering were key parts of this. Um, so it's rare for parents with young children to be able to focus on their art practice at any length of time without having to attend the child's needs or prepare, serve, and clear up a meal. So it was really clear that the childcare was, was an extremely important part of the program. So having childcare provided for on-site was an incredibly liberating experience in terms of work and enabled me to focus fully on my work and the time provided. The fact that they were also catered for made uh, this all the more possible. So without the usual distraction, I got a big chunk of work completed, which I was trying to find the time to complete for many months. Out of four experiments, I made two works that I feel are exhibitable. More importantly, I reclaimed some internal permission to make and to want to seek out more opportunities to do so. I think this is a really important point. So of all the facilities and opportunities provided um, at and by the residency, artists were clear that childcare was by far the most important. In fact, without the childcare offer, several artists would not have even applied for the residency. So the offer for free childcare on site was like no other. That's the real award that made this all possible. I applied because of the childcare support and that there was this offer came an understanding of parenting artists from the organizers that I'd not seen elsewhere. So others were articulate about the range of benefits created by childcare provision. The singularity of this residency and the support at Cowhouse surprised me every day. Its existence is heartwarming, but deeply necessary, especially making art in a country where the cost of childcare puts such limitations and pressure on the will to make artwork. It was wonderful to have children around this special environment. They brought so many positive things to the place, a sense of us all being codependent and co-supporters to each other as artists and parents. It was nice to be reminded that this dynamic can exist, that we can be creative and inventive in how we support each other too. So another positive effect of the residence was artists felt more confident about applying for future opportunities. Networking with other artists facing similar difficulties and learning from others were also beneficial for several people. So there are so many opportunities out there that I feel I could never apply for as a mother. However, taking part in satellite has given me more confidence that I can actually apply for a residency if I can put the supports in place for my children. I have learned from the other artists how they apply for opportunities. I also learned that I could apply for a childcare while applying for funding, which didn't occur to me before. I will definitely do so in the future. So, you know, for a lot of the participants, um, it really seemed like the residency was a really transformative experience. 
So it definitely changed things for me. Apart from the positive experience of getting proper work done, it also made me think differently about trying to bring my children with me on art adventures in the future. My time in the studio was possibly the most efficiently used ever. So I feel it was a fabulous moment of re-entry back into professional life. My whole family felt left, or my whole family left Cow House with a huge boost of well-being. You know, so you can imagine with feedback like this, we couldn't just leave it at this. Like it, it just felt like um, it was such a worthwhile um, pilot program that we needed to take aspects of the program forward. Um, at this stage, I just want to show our website because we, in fact, just finished running um, can everybody see that? Great. So this is our website. Um, this is all our residency information. Um, and what Rosie and I did now, unfortunately, the pandemic um, did end up delaying uh, the parenting residency a couple of years. So, so immediately following uh, our partnership with Mothership, uh, we established the Parenting Artist Residency and it's something that we want to run every year. So Wexford County Council um, has donated some funds to us uh, to, to run this residency annually. Um, and then beyond that, Rosie and I uh, support the residency directly, um, you know, through uh, the the fees we generate from our education program. So both of those things together make the parenting residency possible. So the form that it takes now, uh, we've maintained the childcare. It was really clear that childcare was essential. Um, you know, we know that uh, artists could come with their partners and the partners could provide um, childcare during the day. But there's something really freeing about the actual provision of childcare uh, that gives license um, to, to the artists to really spend full days in the studio. I think it's an incredibly important part of the program. And I think you could see that in, in the feedback that we received, that, that that was really key. And so that's something that we thought was essential to keep. Um, Rosie and I have also played around with the idea in the future of of creating certain times in the year where residencies are open to families, uh, just to kind of open up more opportunities for artists. But with this particular residency, we're committed to childcare. In addition to childcare, artists receive a 500 euro stipend uh, and a two week residency period. Um, the, the pilot program was really flexible in terms of time. Um, there were some residencies that were just three days um, and many that were just a week. Um, but we felt like two weeks was an ideal time. We find that during our other residencies, um, you know, we have this one residency that we run called the open residency, which is, is a really flexible one where people can pick anywhere between one and, and six weeks to come on residency. And we find that two weeks is the most popular time frame for artists. It seems like a realistic amount of time to get away, but it also seems like just enough time to, to make some real headway. Um, during, during their time with us. Um, so, so that we've maintained, uh, that, that we, we've decided that two weeks is, is a good amount of time. And so this year we ran uh, two residencies uh, back to back. So for the first week, I'll just kind of go to our Instagram and show just a few photos. Oh, whoops, sorry. I'm not going to be able to, I'm not going to be able to look click in because I'm not logged into Instagram. But anyway, um, the, you can go on our Instagram uh, at Cow House Studios to, to look at these photos. But uh, the first residency uh, was Fiona Hallinan, Jillian Lawler, Mark Cullen, and Harriet Bowman. And the second uh, session was Fiona O'Reilly, Elaine Leader, and Tanika Williams. And uh, there's photos up here of all sorts of things that were happening during, during that time. Um, and, you know, it, again, it seemed like 
the artists got a huge amount from the experience. And, and so we're really committed to, to doing this year after year. Um, and this is just uh, the Mothership Project, their website. I'll provide a link for that. Um, and I see, I'm just kind of conscious of time. I realize I've, I've been talking now for about a half hour. So I think that's kind of it for me. Um, I'm sure there'll be more opportunities to, to answer questions, but I just wanted to kind of go over um, what we found uh, from that experience. So I'll, I'll stop my screen share now and, and hand it back over to Andrea. But thanks, thanks for the time. That's, uh, that's great. Um, yeah, I, I, I took a few things. I've written a couple of notes down um, from what you said that was, that was really quite interesting to me. Um, you talked about a sustainable model. Um, so my, my other research is in alternative education um, and finding a sustainable model that isn't reliant on arts council funding, especially at the minute. Um, it's just so important, I think, because a lot of schools, a lot of art, uh, alternative art schools are losing their money, are losing their funding. Um, so being able to set that up and then being able to set up a parent and residency on top of that is, is it's quite impressive. Um, that, you know, as, as we mentioned before, that you are one of the very few parenting residencies in Europe is just, it's amazing. Um, some of the things, some of the, the, the feedback that you've seen as well, um, from participants from the satellite um, project um, is about having having small children um, being able to work for any length of time. I think it's probably something I think Alba, Alma maybe uh, discussing in a minute. Since you've got two small children, um, but some other ones like in the internal permission to take to to make to be able to have that self care and be able to look after yourself is just so important. And it's quite interesting as well that you've made it as a two week residency. Um, because that's like my partner isn't in the arts. So for me, if I, you know, if we did have children and we were going to do that, that's a holiday time. And it's it's manageable to be able to do that. If it was a month, it would just, it would never happen. So those sort of like, it seems like little things, but it just makes everything so much more easier for people to, to be able to access it as well, as well as just childcare, that time as well to, to be able to go and take, take it on. Um, just fantastic. So thank you very much for, talking about it. Um, I do put the, the links um, in, the, in the chat. Um, and I'll hand over now to Alma. Um, I've been following her work for quite a lot of years, actually. I think um, after you graduated, I think you graduated roughly around the same sort of time that I did. Um, so I, I think one of the first pieces of work was paper, I think, was one of the first ones that I saw. And then obviously cosmic surgery, uh, which if you haven't seen, is a fantastic piece of work. Um, and then you're currently working on a plant series, uh, which is an exploration of what is real um, and what is manufactured. Um, but I will hand over to you, Alma. That goes to show that I haven't updated my website. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, no, 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 don't be. <laughs> That's my fault. Um, yeah, that, that was, uh, I finished that project just after Nova was born and she's now almost four. So. <laughs> Um, but yeah, um, I am also going to screen share, um, hopefully I can, wait a second, um, see if I can do this as well. Oh, I can't get out of my screen thing, here we go. Um, share. Um, okay, so here we go. Um, uh, yeah, as you said, my name's Alma Haza, and I'm going to go through some work first to explain what I used to do before children um, and how my work's changed because of that, and then also talk about a project that I'm doing with my partner, who's also a photographer, Nick Ballon. Um, a uh, picnic. Uh, we're working on that at the moment, or still kind of setting it up, but we've got Arts Council funding and got six months of programmes. Um, but anyway, so this was the project that you mentioned, Cosmic Surgery, that kind of hit the road running, I guess, for me as I came out of university. I started this project and then um, that kind of set my place as an artist, I guess. 
um, and the whole series is um, with paper folding because it's called cosmic surgery and um, I'm really dyslexic so a lot of things uh, projects and works kind of come out from how I see the world I guess from being dyslexic but also um, the, the wording my mum used to always joke about how um, I change words to kind of fit how I see them and we were talking about cosmetic surgery and I kept saying cosmic surgery and that's how this project then evolved into cosmic surgery and how it kind of turned into this uh, futuristic project where uh, people were to get um, cosmic surgery and have the ability to change what they look like. So you can see these um, photographs as um, the person transitioning to their new selves, or maybe that is their face. I don't know. That's up to the viewer to decide. But I made a whole book to go with it. Um, and this was an exhibition I did at the photographer's gallery with it. Um, so I made like 3D shapes with origami with their faces. There's the book in the um, display case, uh, but that was the first book I made. And then I um, crowdfunded um, a book which sold out quite quickly. So I don't have any more. And I don't really intend to make any more. I think I'm done with that project. It's kind of, it took over my, life for a couple of years so I was like okay I'm done with that now um but yeah so lots of paper manipulation stuff like that and that was really fun then I went into the pseudo series which was kind of just before Nova was born um I started this and then I had a show um at Unseen in Amsterdam so I remember finishing this series or because they're all handmade 3D pieces uh, everything has to kind of be made by me I can't like send it off I can't just print it it's all yeah a lot of process in each of the works um, um which is a bit frustrating when someone buys a piece of weird and knowingly you say oh great I have to now you know put it all together and then uh, send it off so there's a lot of work in my yeah in the process and Nova was just born as I had to had finished this series and making the exhibition was quite tricky childcare wise. I remember her just having her on the desk. I remember seeing pictures of Natasha's talk and the baby just there on the side. And that's pretty much how I worked. Um, I don't actually understand how I did it now having two and with the second one being pretty much the same age as Nova was at this point. But um, this series is kind of based on um fake news at the time it was like trump and all that kind of thing and how everything kind of re gets regurgitated on the news and changed and like i kind of wanted to make it beautiful i guess um the chinese whisper effect um so i photographed house plants and things that i could buy from yeah get it access to and in photograph it in my studio which was absolutely tiny at the time um as soon as I set up the lights, for example, I had no space to move around. It was really tiny. Um, but this is, yeah, so this is kind of my take on um, fake news and stuff. Um, so each layer has, like, you can see a cut hole. And if you see the actual piece, you can see through them and you don't know which one's the real plant. So you're kind of trying to work out where's the real photograph and where does it change and then uh, the cut hole and and then for example on the bottom one here you can see there's cuts in the photograph as well so you can't tell if it's a cut or if it's the original photograph or it's yeah so there's lots of manipulation in the work kind of thing and then I've moved into puzzles because I think after after having Nova my brain was rewired in a different way and I needed peace I guess and puzzles and origami and all that kind of thing creates like this meditation and I can calm myself down I don't know and puzzles was another thing that did that um, and I really I was always interested in identical twins um, and genetics and things like that so this series started off by photographing identical twins um, and then I would send them off to get made into a puzzle so they're both thousand piece puzzles 
and they have the same cut so you can transfer the puzzle pieces. Um, so I swapped every other piece. It wasn't originally what I was going to do. I was just going to change their faces, but it wasn't effective enough to what I was after. So then I started changing every other piece. And it was, as soon as I did that, the whole picture changed and it made sense for the whole, you know, identical twins aren't completely identical. There are a few things that in genetics like that you can't necessarily see, but Weirdly enough, as soon as I photographed them side by side, they looked quite different. But if you saw them in the street, you wouldn't you wouldn't necessarily see their differences. But if you photographed them separately, then you could see the differences. And that was quite interesting. But anyway, so I turned these into um, misformed uh, alien, I guess, portraits. <laughs> and um, sometimes you could, uh, well, basically, as soon as I started, you wouldn't, I wouldn't know where the, the faces, so the eyes or the mouths or anything, where would they would land? Um, so that was quite interesting as well to completely let go and just transform this picture into, um, yeah, whatever it was going to come out as. I, I was out of control of what the outcome was going to be. Um, and they're for sale, and it's quite interesting to see most people buy one or the other. Um, they don't necessarily buy them together, which I think is a bit shame, but. Um, and it's meant that one has sold out quite quickly and the other one hasn't, for example. Um, but anyway, so yeah, that that was just before coronavirus. And then I decided I'm going to make them more accessible because my artwork is quite expensive. I want people to be able to afford it. So I'm going to try and transform this piece into something that people can then make at home and then keep and then frame. I don't know, up to them. Uh, I decided to send the original artwork, so these pieces, to the um, puzzle makers, and then they printed them out. So as you can see on that the second picture, the one with the yellow background, uh, the puzzle pieces are printed onto the puzzle. So you've got, it's, it's an extra challenge for the person who's making it, I guess. Um, and I was extra mean because on the design of the box, I didn't even give them the example of what it's going to look like with the extra puzzle lines so that is a bit mean but lots of people have managed it and they really enjoy doing them and I seem to have hit the nail on the head when I released them because it was just lockdown so right at the beginning I sold a ton to Italy um, <laughs> and then it went on from there it was really crazy um, good timing and and obviously perfect for me because I wasn't really earning very much money as a parent and then also with lockdown and everything you couldn't really do anything so I was just uh, heading out to the post office most days <laughs> sending out puzzles so that was quite handy um, weird, weirdly well timed anyway so this moving on to working on commissions and collaborating with my partner Nick Ballon um, it didn't it didn't kind of occur to us until this commission came along that we could work together, even though that's how we met. I worked for Nick and then a dog, a house, two kids later, we were now finally working together. But um, yeah, so this was Save the Children got in touch with me to do this piece on Syrian children being displaced and um, their kind of hurt from the war and everything like that and how to uh, relate that into a picture because it's hidden um, so they wanted to work with me and my paper manipulation to kind of show that um, the only problem is how am I going to travel um, with a, a very young child um, going to a slightly dangerous place and then yeah it was really busy at the time as well so I kind of thought, okay, how am I going to do this? I would love to do this, but how am I going to do it? And I don't really trust sending out just any old photographer. Maybe I can send out Nick and he would photograph these people, the children. And I trust him completely to get a beautiful picture. Um, I know his work inside out. I feel like he can understand what I'm wanting from it as well. Uh, likewise and things like that and simplicity. And so, yeah, he went out there um photographed these beautiful pictures and then came back and let me destroy them basically um i made animations 
um, with these pieces as well. So you can search um, this project and each one of them has audio of the either the parent or the carer or the child speaking. Um, and then the paper animates to kind of emulate their trauma, I guess. Um, and they're, I think they're really powerful pieces. And then we also did another collaboration more, more recently, at the end of last year, um, with a long time collaborator um, with Nick, actually, Maharam. They're a textile company in New York. Um, and they've been working with Nick forever. But um, they asked, did he have any ideas for a campaign? And they have met me before because I've gone over to New York while he's been photographing with Nova at age six months. And I think they met me then and realized I was an artist too. And maybe we can work together on something. So that was another, like, almost being pushed together. Oh, yeah, we could work together again. Okay, we can do this. Um, so this all kind of came together with Nick and I visiting my mum's farm. She's got a flower farm that she set up. She was an artist. Um, and I guess after having us and after us, uh, two children leaving her, suddenly realizing, okay, I'm gonna do something completely different. And she set up a whole flower farm and made a massive business out of that. Um, but we would stay with her in the summers and Nick would kind of, he, he, he made a film for her um, about the flower farm every year, uh, no, uh, every season for a year. And I think during that time he thought, maybe I can take some pictures that we can then use for this campaign. Um, and it was all kind of bit, uh, kind of, uh, and I guess like, mashed it together I don't know it was he went into a poly poly tunnel at my mum's farm and photographed some pictures then we kind of had a look at them to see if they could correlate with the fabrics that they Maharam had and then I played around with printing the pictures off and cutting them up and I, I did them really small scale at the time and it was a really sunny day and flapping up these pieces and the shadows that it cast was just it just worked really well and kind of considering how the polytunnel was diffused light and morning and it kind of was like a juxtaposed position I guess but you know the, the the details that Nick had photographed the fuzziness and the diffused light and then this really harsh sunlight worked really well um so yeah so all these are kind of manipulated with my photographs and uh, with paper and pulling up and things like that. Um, Nick did find it quite difficult with both the Save the Children and this series being almost squashed by my work. Like it's more recognizable as my work than his work. I think he's got a little bit of, yeah, <laughs> he finds it difficult to let go on that side, I think, because I, I guess his photograph has been manipulated so much so that it turns into more my work, I guess. Um, we've just done a Maharam campaign, which I can't really share yet, um, which is the other way around. So we used fa fabric that I then cut into shapes and things. And then he took it to the Isle of Skye and photographed it um, and looking through the holes and things like that. And it was kind of abstract with the wind and the weather, what would happen to the shapes that I had cut. But that that made me feel kind of uneasy as well because I had no ability to control the picture at all. <laughs> I was sat here looking after the kids and he was over there in Isle of with the fabrics I had cut up and I didn't know what the pictures were going to look like when he came back. Um, but we have that the trust, I think, to work on these projects. It's quite interesting to um, work out these collaborations. Um, this is a slide just to show parenting, motherhood, children working. <laughs> um, the top picture, it's quite funny. We were staying with my parents in Germany and a job from, from the New Yorker came in about lockdown and gardening and things like that. Um, and I was kind of questioning with Nick, do I take this on? Like he's, we, we have this motto, uh, money or creativity. So if it's ridiculous amount of money, then okay, take it. And if it's 
really, really creative, but not very much money, but you feel like you can get something out of it creatively and uh, the picture, you know, you can share it around and you can be really proud of it. And it can, you know, process it. Like you can try out different ideas and that can then lead on to another project. We kind of say that those are the two things that can sway taking you away from the family. Um, but as you can see, that doesn't necessarily take me away from the family. I use the family. So this is my stepmother posing and my daughter kind of swaying in some leaves to help me, I guess. Um, and yeah, I'm even I'm so hot that I'm just photographing my bra and my thing. So that's a bit gross. Um, but anyway, yeah, so I used what I had there um to make this work. Um and I used my dad's printer and just photographed in a couple of days when I had some spare time basically and that made it work and that was really great to have Nick just to kind of push me yes you can do this um uh, the one down below that's our second child um and Nick obviously just having to manage his work and then just take her out whenever I need to do some work it, the there is a little bit I guess that's the one thing that we argue about is childcare and how we can manage um, both our processes, both our work. He travels a lot for his work, um, which leaves me in a bit of a, like, I can't do anything while he's gone. Not really, anyway, not at the moment. Um, and when he is here, I'm constantly doing this yo-yo effect of passing the baby. Um, but yeah, I think once once they get a bit older, it will change, I guess. I, childcare is so expensive. Nick wants to put the children in for more and I've got this guilt issue where I, I want to have them around, but I also want to do work and I can't obviously do both. So they have to go to childcare, um, but that is incredibly expensive. So then you have to work lots and not necessarily on personal projects either because you can't afford to do that. So Nick will then do these big jobs, but that will take him away for a long time. And it's just this battle of how do we make it all work? Um, Nick has also not worked on a personal project, which he really wants to do for a long, long time because he's working for money to fund our projects, um, picnic and the house and our lifestyle and everything. So yeah, it, it's a battle of that really. Um, this leads me on to the project that I'm working on now. And it's, it was interesting listening to Natasha last week talking about how she's moving over to textiles because I don't know if it's something when you turn into a parent, you kind of change your process because of it. I don't know. I think it's another thing is, you know, how I was using the puzzle, the kind of relaxation. You come home, you've looked after the kids, you want to do some work, but you your brain is just ugh, tired and you just don't really want to, I don't know, you want to be able to work, but not have the, you don't have the ability to do what you used to be able to. So the projects that I'm doing now is, is very family based. It's, this is, um, it's quite a big piece, um, which Nick said, I'm never gonna finish. It's just gonna be going on forever. It's like, well, I don't know. It might, might end up being an unfinished piece and that's where I, yeah, I leave it. I don't know. I quite like it as it is, <laughs> so, um, but it's, it's me, my mum and my brother, and we're walking out to the bank in Germany um, to watch a storm roll over the Black, um, Black Forest Mountains, basically. And my dad filmed most of my childhood. It's interesting watching them because they did a very much 50-50 share. So my dad would have me in the afternoon, me and my brother, and then my mum would have us in the morning. And then while they weren't with us, they would do their own art. So my dad was a painter, he did the one behind me. My mum was a, a potter and sculptor. And so she would work in the morning and do all that. And then my dad would um, work in the afternoon or the other way around, I don't know what I said, but anyway. Um, yeah, so it was quite interesting to see that and, and the videos and I guess that, has a lot to do with my guilt because I really want that for my children to have both of us all the time would be amazing and to be able to you know I don't know we had such a free life a free childhood you know we we're just running around in the street and my dad is he's filming from the window but we're like miles away outside 
splashing in a puddle and he's just filming from there and that feels safe. You can't really do that nowadays or where we are. So I, I think I do need to let that side of my lifestyle and my childhood go because it's not necessarily possible for me and my children. But that doesn't, it doesn't leave you. It kind of, I need to give that to my children, I guess, a little bit, I feel like anyway. So this whole project's kind of taken on a very um, long, slow process of textiles and cross stitch um, and memory, I guess. I want the whole series to feel like it could be anyone's childhood. Um, and I, interestingly, I've just had a intern for three months um, and she helped me go through the films and take some screenshots. And it was interesting to see her take on things as well. So it wasn't just me photographing screenshots of myself all the time. Like she was taking other things and it was quite interesting. Um, but she also, while doing it, felt like it was her childhood, which I thought was interesting, even though her childhood was must have been quite different. She was a lot younger than me. Obviously, it's a different time. She's also got an extra sibling. Yeah, but it was interesting to see that she can correlate to the project. Um, I'm also going to try and do a whole wall of faces. I don't know if everyone has this, but on their phone, you've got this ability of they, they kind of pinpoint people in your album and it's really creepy and I think you can switch it off but I quite like it <laughs> it kind of finds um different people and it's really interesting to see who they found because some people I don't even know and it's just circled that person because it's clear in the picture but so this is going to be a wall of faces that are screenshotted from the films and um, that I've made into tapestry and I don't know if you can see the faces as they are now, but maybe if you grabbed your phone and put it on camera mode, can you see them clearer? Because I think that is a really interesting part of this series as well. As soon as you um, see them in a different light, you can kind of, it becomes clearer, it homes it in, and then you can see the faces. Um, and I want that to be a thing. So the exhibition is just going to be a wall of faces and people can come in with their cameras and go, oh yeah, I can see the face there, I can see that. Um, I just realized I've got two of my, uh, two of the same ones there. Um, yeah, they're all, they're not necessarily all people I know either, which I quite like as well. So um, there's quite a few of me in that. <laughs> the middle one here is um, a bandage with onions on, which my dad and mum, swore by in Germany I don't know why but if you put onions on your ears it was meant to heal um earache I think <laughs> anyway so that's uh yeah that's um I don't know I'm going into picnic but um sorry I feel like my brain is a massive jumble anyway this is how I work you can see the innards of my brain today um you got child child thinking about like when when Kiki need, next needs her feed and then also thinking about projects and and for example this is another little cross stitch I'm doing right now on a tiny tiny leftover piece of my schnuggletuch which is like a snuggle cloth from when I was a child and then there's a picture on it I don't know if you can see it but it's turning into a picture of me with the cloth <laughs> So I'm putting myself on it again. Um, uh, um, it's the only remaining piece of that cloth because I used to rip it up as I slept. So that, yeah, so that's my project. And in the background, we bought, Nick and I bought a small shop, I guess, down on the seafront in St. Leonard's and we decided to make our studio there. But we were kind of battling with the idea of what, what can we do upstairs? What can upstairs be? Um, it could just be hired out to someone, but it's quite an open space. So the stairs lead down into the studio and there would always be that, you know, noise and things going on. I don't know. It just felt like maybe we should control it a bit better. Um, so Nick has the brilliant idea of using it as a, a community space. Um, so we decided upstairs was gonna be a photo book library. 
and we've contacted millions of publishers and they've donated tons of books to us. It's really, really great. But we want more, obviously. But at the moment, this is what we've got. We haven't got any funding. So Nick's been funding whatever he can. The whole refurbishment, for example, was with with our money rather than funded money. Um, and then those crate boxes is just a temporary thing just to deal with shelving because we don't have any money for shelving yet. Um, and then everyone who works with us is volunteer led as well. Um, but we have just managed to get arts funding count, uh, council funding for workshops that we're doing with children and underprivileged families and things like that and communities and refugee pro projects and things like that. Um, we've got six months funding, which, yeah, like you said, Arts, Found, Arts Council funding is a, a ball like to try and um, get. So that was a bit ridiculous um, just to think that we've only got six months and then what do we do after that? Um, but it is great because we've got the six months, we can learn from it and then see what we can do. And it's interesting to see how you fund your um, residency, Frank. Um, I don't know if we can do that, but because um, we haven't got the necessarily the space and capacity to do that, maybe I don't know. It, but it's it would be interesting to talk more with you afterwards um, about that. Um, so at the moment, yeah, upstairs is a resource library. People can come in, look through books, um, get research. I don't know. I'm trying to sell the the volunteering a bit more because I think it's a great opportunity for any artist, student, any, or well, anyone to get inspiration, to come in, sit at the desk, look through books, use our internet, you know, that kind of thing and keep it open. But this, it's a bit tricky at the moment to try and find enough people. This was our launch um, and fundraiser. We did a raffle and um, had lots of local breweries actually donate beers and drinks. So we can then raise money from that as well. Um, and uh, Andreas Blackman, he's German, but he's local, um, photographed lots of people around St. Leonard's and Hastings, and we've got his mm. pictures in the window, which we're kind of hoping to do um, on, I'm not sure, on a monthly basis, potentially. Uh, we've got a giant printer downstairs so we can print people's work and then show them in the window. Um, I'm guessing we're going to mainly choose local people and then potentially also pictures that we take during the workshops. Um, and uh, this was the first workshop we did, which was kind of more of a, a trial to see how it would work. Um, and we used a local photographer called Guy Bolgaro, who works a lot with flash and throwing objects everywhere. And, and he's got an amazing book that's also in the library. Um, and it kind of correlated quite well with children and play, the, yeah, the playful nature of it. So the, the idea is that we're allowing children to kind of open up their creativity and kind of see things in a different way. And at the moment, I think, yeah, it's, it's a learning curve. We did a, a workshop yesterday, which was very ambitious with um, set designer um, Clarice, I'm not going to say her name very well, but um, anyway, you can look her up. She's uh, French and she's a brilliant set designer, but in the top picture, she's got the green band on her um, and she's actually currently breastfeeding her youngest child there. So, you know, you can, we're a lot of, it kind of, it fits in very well with what we're doing here. You, you know, we don't stop working, even though we've got children attached to us all the time and their partners wisping the kids off and then bringing them back just to get fed and then going off again um yeah this one was quite ambitious uh, she decided she wanted to do a workshop where everyone uh, was kind of like speed dating with with a hamper a picnic hamper and each hamper had a different theme so you had the seaside theme a so british jubilee theme um a tropical theme and a pink party theme and these are some of the snaps I took yesterday just of yeah behind the scenes I guess um and it was it was interesting I think it definitely worked with older children um the pink one is actually my oldest who 
enjoyed the sweets a lot um, and dressing up, but not so much um, understanding how to you know, build sets and stuff. So uh, the older children really got into creating a, a scene, which got very messy after a while, after, you know, the third, the fourth picnic that you got to was just half eaten and destroyed. So it's a bit hard to kind of make something out of it, but it was interesting. Um, uh, and also the, the kind of figuring out, do we need to feed the children? Was this meant to, you know, fulfill their lunch as well as the workshop? It's, it's those kind of things that we're really trying to learn like, um, from this as well um yeah but it's a, it's a learning curve that's for sure and then i think that's my the end of my slideshow um but i also i can show you the picnic website we're kind of setting up i don't know if you can see that um but yeah you can have a look more on there i think i'm not sure what the next workshop is but um our Georgie, who's working with us, who doesn't have children and has the time, is setting up all the workshops, uh, which is great because I don't know how we would manage otherwise. Um, we're about to go off on um, a three month um, trip around Europe with the van and the kids and the dog. And I'm really looking forward to it because it just allows me to just concentrate on the kids and not, not the house or anything like that or picnic just the kids and I'm going to take a camera and be a lot more relaxed with it. Um, Chloe said an interesting thing where, you know, she she's now taking commissions on instead of doing her personal work just because she needed time timelines. And I have been taking on commissions and there's a different kind of, um, it's different kind of stress with it, but it does mean you relax a bit more on your, um, I guess the the need to finish that. I don't know. There's so many more ideas and process-led things that you have to do with your personal projects that you can't finish them, and it, that stresses you out in in a different way. Whereas when you do a commission, it's it's that you finish it and it's gone. Um, yeah, so it's interesting. I think when we go away, I feel like I'm going to just relax, photograph what I see and then bring it back and see what happens, I guess. And there's no pressure.